Dr. Sheckman, welcome back to UCLA. Thanks very much for joining us. So I want to ask you first, um, you've had a strong passion for science from a very young age, yeah. long before you came to UCLA sure, as an undergraduate. Sure, sure. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your love for science, why you felt so strongly so young? Um, my father was an engineer, uh, and I think even when, we, when I was growing up in Minnesota, I had, some, I had an interest in astronomy, and I remember he had a picture of a, a, a bacterial virus that he had taken as an engineer with General Mills. It was just something to look at as a size, for a size uh, of a particle. And uh, these I, uh, stuck in my mind. And then when we moved to Southern California when I was 10, uh, in, I think in junior high school, I developed an interest in life science, and particularly in, with, in microorganisms. I remember uh, I had a toy microscope, and I used to look at pond scum and see these little creatures, paramecium rotifers, swimming or crawling around, and it was endlessly fascinating. So I was a you know, strange kid. I would sit in my room and look at this stuff. And uh, at a certain point, my, my father said, you know, that's just a toy after all. And I, I got kind of offended at that. And so I decided to save up. And uh, eventually, after mowing enough lawns and babysitting enough, I was able to buy a professional microscope when I was around 12. And I actually still have that microscope. And so I, I spent my entire high school years working on a science fair project each year and uh, sort of nurture, nurturing this love, uh, love for science. The Professor Merchant uh, had said that she thought you still have saved to this day your admissions letter. I, from I have it, I have it, and when I was here a couple of years ago for uh, another award uh, that, that's given in the Los Angeles area called the Mastery Prize, I gave a seminar here and I showed not only the, my admission letter to UCLA, but, a, but a, my, one of my favorite possessions, which is a picture of then Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar going up for a layup in the very first game uh, in Poly Pavilion where he was eligible to play varsity. I was at that game. That was mm. my very first uh, UCLA game. So, uh, Did you go to many of the games in Poly I, Pavilion? I went, every, I went to every home game while I was here. In fact, mm -hmm. I remember um, you know, when I was a freshman uh, and tickets went on sale, I waited up outside of Poly Pavilion all night. Really? In line to get wow. my season tickets. Wow. I spent $6.25 for the entire season. <laughs> <laughs> now, you came from a family of modest means, yeah. is that right? Yeah. Well, modest. I mean, it was middle class. Well, he was an engineer. Uh, yeah, my father engineer. was an engineer. My mother was a homemaker. It was middle class. I mean, UCLA in 1966, I don't know, cost $40 a term in fees. Right. And in spite of that, I remember just at that time, Ronald Reagan had been elected governor. And there was a protest on campus when he came by. And I still have a button that I, that I have in my desk drawer that says, our position, no tuition. <laughs> this in the face of $40 a term. So, and I lived in the student co-op, which was the least expensive option available, probably still is. And uh, altogether, my books and fees and room and board cost no more than I could make in a summer job. And I've heard you make, um, make various remarks along the lines of, of that you feel very strongly about the importance of yeah. public education yeah. and places like UCLA and UC Berkeley yeah. as you've called them engines of social change yeah. for working yeah. class families. Yeah. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Uh, uh, y your readers will know that uh, UCLA, Berkeley, and several of the other UC campuses bring in more Pell Grant students on each campus than the entire Ivy League put together. And uh, so what we do is we offer these people an opportunity to you know, make a better life for themselves. And uh, that's and a, a crucial, crucial feature of what we do. And you also have some statements, do you, about how you feel California should be treating public education and the yeah. amount of support? That yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tragedy, really. I mean, uh, when I was in high school in Orange County, California invested in public schools uh, near the highest in the country in terms of per capita expenditure. It's, you know, it's near the bottom now. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, a middle class family could have basically, my, you know, could afford a f higher education for free. My, my, my family, we had, there were five kids in my family. They all went to colleges, universities. My father had to pay nothing for the, for the education. Uh, but unfortunately, higher education, both private and public, has turned into a private commodity where one has to uh, go into serious debt just to have the, uh, the opportunity. And I, I fail to see why we have lost that social compact that uh, propelled this institution to where it is today. The state has dramatically reduced its funding for Yeah, the I mean, the, you know, the university administrators refer to it as a, 
a, a disinvestment. That's a polite term. I, I, I call it an abandonment. I think we've been abandoned by the state in favor of prisons. Uh, fortunately, now because of what's happened this past month, I have uh, you know I have some ears that uh, that listen to me. I had dinner uh, the other night with uh, Governor Brown and with uh, President Napolitano of the UC President's office and. I, I think they understand. They're very smart. They they know, but they're under tremendous political pressure. You discussed this with Governor Brown. Yeah, well, public he, education. He, he, yes, I gave a presentation. He he knows he knows how I feel. But you know, he was a student at, at UC Berkeley too. He knows. You know, it's more and more difficult to compete with the privates now. Uh, I mean, even if you look at at this you know this rarefied group of Nobel laureates, uh, most of the Nobel laureates, uh, American Nobel laureates come from uh, the private institutions. Very few come from publics. This year I'm a, of nine American laureates in the sciences and economics. I'm the only one from a public institution. The rest are from places like Harvard and Yale and University of Chicago. And so I think that's uh, it's a small indication of the fact that uh, um, uh, states around the country, not just in California, have systematically remove funds from education to plug other gaps. Um, let me ask you about your time at UCLA. Yeah. Um, so it looks to me from what I've seen that you've worked in research laboratories essentially the entire time yeah. you were at UCLA and in different yeah. laboratories. Yeah. So let me ask, ask you from your very first year at UCLA you went into a laboratory. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I took freshman chemistry. Uh, I had a wonderful experience. Uh, and uh, did well in my first term, and as a result was admitted to uh, the honors section of the freshman chemistry class in the third term. But, uh, but uh, that every student in the class was given a slot in a chemistry laboratory and expected to participate in a, in a research project. So I was, uh, just by chance, uh, assigned to the lab of a young assistant professor by the name of uh, Michael Conrad. Uh, I think he's no longer here. But he was a molecular biologist. Actually, he'd been a postdoctoral fellow uh, with a famous uh, virologist named Gunther Stent at Berkeley. And uh, I came in, and I was some you know, young, <laughs> know-nothing freshman. And so he was trying to dispense with me. Yeah. Well, uh, OK. Yeah. Anyway, I didn't know anything at the time, that's for sure. And he said, OK, well, in order for you to do anything, you have to read this book. And so he gave me a book that became influential in my career. It's called The Molecular Biology of the Gene. It was the first edition of James Watson's textbook on the subject of the burgeoning field of molecular biology. And uh, to me, the, the book was, uh, was a revelation. It was uh, you know, written in a style very different from a stodgy textbook. It was with short declarative sentences, very opinionated as only Watson can be, and you know, telling, telling it like it was, with the new techniques of genetics and molecular biology revealing life processes. I knew from that moment that, that I wanted to somehow participate in some molecular biology research. Interesting. That was, it was that book. That it was that book that, that got it going for me. So then in my uh, sophomore year, I worked a summer job and came back in my sophomore year and I started shopping around for a real research opportunity. And I actually had a crazy idea for a kind of experiment that I wanted to do about how to improve the efficiency of infection of bacteria by viral DNA. And so I, I shopped around, and uh, a couple of people said, no, sorry, I don't have any room. But then I, I found this fellow, Dan Ray, who was then also a, a beginning assistant professor. And he said, oh, well, OK, great, fine. <laughs> Come on in. And uh, I became immersed in, uh, in research in his laboratory. And being in Dan's lab was, was great. I, uh, I learned a lot about, you know, actually doing experiments and... Uh, you designed your own experiments. Yeah, I've, I designed some. I, had, I, I found that I had, a, uh, you know, an ability to think somewhat creatively about uh, how things worked, how this virus might work, and designing experiments to test how that might work. And he gave me a lot of freedom to do this, and so I was there day and night. Uh, started suffering in my coursework because I found working in the lab much more interesting than, than going to courses. And when you were still a UCLA undergraduate, you published research in some of the major scientific yeah. journals. Yeah. Uh, Nature, one of the top journals yeah. in the world, with yeah. Journal of Molecular Biology. That, that must have been very rewarding. Yeah, uh, that, uh, that, that's the currency of what we do. And so uh, that was very exciting. When I, uh, when, uh, from the work that I was doing just in my sophomore year, uh, Dan Ray 
uh, decided to put me on as a co-author on two of his papers. I, I was uh, I was thrilled. So I, that that was uh, you know. So we don't we're not interested in money, but we are interested in that kind of recognition uh, and publication is the currency of what we do. Now I understand you have um, strong views about the publication of yeah. scientific research yeah. Yeah. in journals, including yeah. some of the top journals yeah. in America yeah. and, and in yeah. the world. And yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, we're, we're in a crisis phase, I would say. The literature has burgeoned. Uh, investigators clamor to publish in, I mean, there are thousands of titles in, in biomedical science, and yet, and yet everyone clamors to publish in a very small number of journals, often commercial journals. These journals are uh, Nature and its clones, uh, Science, and uh, an Elsevier journal called Cell. And, uh, there are, you know, there are great discoveries in these journals, and I published in them myself. But uh, but the problem is several fold. First of all, all the decisions in those journals are made by professional editors, not active scientists. These are people who trained scientifically, but who, for many of them, have not act been active in science for decades, and yet yet they're the ones who make the decision about whether a paper is to be reviewed, and they make the final decision after consulting scientists about what a, what what should be published. Uh, I think. Sometimes these people's judgment is questionable. Secondly, because these journals uh, are modeled on a print version, although they of course have an online presence, they're modeled on a print version, they restrict the number of papers and the number of pages that they will accept. Artificially, they've created an artificial commodity, which makes no sense in the electronic world of the 21st century, where most young scholars don't even look at hard copies of journals. They read papers online. They go to journal websites online. So why should we restrict the number of papers that a journal accepts, making at the end, at the, you know, at the margins, what are capricious decisions about what gets published? Science, for instance, will accept only 6% of the papers that are submitted. Scholars work sometimes years to generate data and then struggle for over a year uh, with science, back and forth, more and more modifications, only to eventually, very often, to have their papers rejected, even after having done everything that referees want. So this is a this is, this is, the system is broken, and we need journals, selective journals, at the high end, that use a different model, that are not based on print, and that are not uh, and and where active scientists are making the decisions. And most scientists would would prefer to be judged by their peers. There are many things that you could do with the Nobel Prize money. I understand that you've decided to donate it to the University yeah. of California. Can you tell us about yeah. your donation? Yeah, so uh, I've been thinking about this for some years, and uh, I decided uh, that the money was more useful for the university than it was for me. I, I'm comfortable. I, 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 money has never been an issue of interest for me. Um, so I, uh, I thought about how to deploy that money best, uh, since it's not a, you know, it's not a fortune, $400,000. For me, it's a lot. I'm a thousandaire, not a millionaire. Um, and uh, I thought the best way would be to uh, do this openly, not anonymously, make a gesture that I was doing this for the university uh, a, 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 as an inducement for other people of greater means to assist in the creation of a chair in basic cancer biology uh, in honor of my mother and sister who both died of cancer. And so I announced this at a trustees meeting a few weeks ago in Pasadena. And even just in the moments after I uh, made that announcement, I had uh, volunteers from the, from the audience donate funds. And uh, we just had, just this past week, a very substantial $1 million donation to fill out this chair. Are you able to say what qualities make for a great scientist? Because it seems like when you're going down those blind alleys, yeah. it seems like things like creativity and perseverance yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you are can't, important. Well, you can't be risk averse. That's, I think, a major distinction that I find in in, this, in the, even the brightest students that I have in my class uh, who are you know, going to professional schools. I, if you want to be a lawyer or if you want to be a physician uh, and you're smart and willing to work hard, you'll get there. And you'll, you know, you'll be comfortable at some level. Maybe you won't be rich, but you'll, be cer you'll certainly be comfortable. But as a scientist, there is no such assurance that you know, there are some incredibly bright people who fail miserably <laughs> because uh, you know, it's risky. And, um, and the bigger the bigger the in, risk. in terms of getting grants, getting funding, well, or, just or having getting things major work, discoveries. yeah, major discoveries. Uh, 
So you cannot be risk averse if you want to succeed at a high level. You have to be willing to gamble and do something new and preferably something that no one else has done before. How have you reacted when your research wasn't going well? Uh, well, I remember as a graduate student there was a particularly frustrating year. Uh, I, I mean, overall I, things worked very well so I can't complain, but there was, a, there was a really bad year where I was just struggling and I was failing at every turn. And, uh, uh, at that time, I had just gotten married, and we went on a long honeymoon for about a month. And uh, that was great because I, I had a chance to think. I was away from the bench. I was, you know, I, I, I couldn't continue to be frustrated because I was enjoying myself. And I had a chance to think about a new strategy. And I came back with that uh, fresh idea and uh, told uh, Cornberry that I wanted to do this. And, he, you know, he said, okay, go ahead. And it worked. Those are great answers. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, well, just to emphasize once again how grateful I am to uh, the opportunity I had here at UCLA and uh, everything the University of California has done for me. I was not only an undergraduate here, but a postdoctoral fellow at UC San Diego and now 38, going on 38 years at Berkeley. And so uh, uh, I feel very strongly that this is an institution that needs to be supported and continue to be supported publicly. Well, you've certainly done a lot more for the university than the university has done for you. I don't know about that.